with you all have the Bible study that we got to have this morning, and I will say that to get our minds ready for what we're going to look at this morning, a lot of times I will say, don't, don't let me lose you on the illustration, right? Some people get really going on the illustration, and we miss the whole big point. One of the things that we talked about in the Bible class is how people are running wild with a misconception about the whole nation of Israel, and uh, Dad brought up what the time frame would have been for Ronald Reagan and Jerry Falwell. And I read in a book not too long ago, actually was written, I believe, by a Baptist who wasn't going for all that. And he said, premillennialism, he said, was nothing more than a scam to get Jerry Falwell and Israel rich. But people just go crazy with it. And it's because they take these concepts and they don't slow down and they don't look at the text and they don't ask enough questions. So this morning we're going to open up with this question. Do Christian liberties work the same way as nationalistic liberties? Now, we're going to have to say yes and no. And you basically see the, pic the picture here, we the people, and what's, what's the fist doing? You're holding tight to your liberties. Now, when you think about this and we say nationalistic, when our rights have been infringed on, what have we been willing to do in the past? Well, if something is of such grave importance, then individuals have been willing to go to war over it. Are there some things we need to go to spiritual war, war over? Well, absolutely. The Bible says so in 2 Corinthians 10. But he says the nature of our warfare is not carnal. It's casting down thoughts and imaginations that exalt itself against God. So let's think about this. The way that we treat our national rights, and we're going to bring this over into the religious realm, and we're going to make some application, and we're going to go through... And look at Old Testament examples, just like last week we looked at Hebrews 12.1, what great cloud of witness. And we said, what is that? It's the characters, the individuals in chapter 11 of Hebrews who did great things. We're going to look at a great cloud of witness again today. Uh, it's not going to be so many great things like last week, though. But think about this. Here's our national right. And it really is not a national right. It goes across the board to any nation, really, that, you ought to be, that you're living in. The nation ought to uphold this. Individuals have a God-given right to defend themselves. In Luke 22, 36, Jesus said to his disciples, Then he said unto them, But now he that has a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now we realize, I would hope that we realize, when Jesus actually gave the teaching of turn the other cheek, he didn't mean just let somebody sit there and beat you to death. And he didn't mean for you to let someone come in and just abuse your whole family. We have the right to defend ourselves. For us today in America, that's our Second Amendment right. Other countries may not call it their Second Amendment right, but they have this God-given right. But here's what, think about how we do, though. Have you seen these people? Do you have the Second Amendment? Yes. Do you have the God-given right to protect yourself? Yes. Is it necessary to go into 7-Eleven with an AR-15 strapped on you? And really, what is the person doing when they do that? It's more, Mark says, showing out. It's more of a thing of they really want to talk about it. There are better ways to talk about it. These type of individuals, I look, do you have the right to carry the AR-15 this way? Sure. I wouldn't want to do it. Why? I don't want, if somebody else has a gun, they know right away we're taking this dude out first because he's got this big old gun. I just don't want that type of attention. But what are they doing? Some of these people just want to put it in other folks' face. I just don't think that's conducive to the discussion across the aisle. People are saying, well, you don't, you don't need to have this type of gun and whatever this lesson not about guns, so don't let me lose you here. We're talking about the way that people have a liberty, and instead of just enjoying it, taking it, saying, yeah, we have the right to bear arms, they then have to exude and put that in other people's faces. Now, let's think about this. Do we just have infinite liberty in America? And what we're going to do, we're going to come to, can anybody, I'm saying, if you think of the word liberty, you know where we're going in the Bible. We're going to Galatians chapter 5. People, and I, they do believe this though, people will talk to you and they just act like they have any rights. You know, that if you just do anything to me, I can do whatever I want back to you. It does not work that way. And people would say this, people would say, well, that's my right. Where we are in America, basically, people would say you have the right to sleep with anybody, and then you then have the right to go and get an abortion. Well, wait a minute. That's where we need to start having some discussion. Do you really have the liberty to take a life away from somebody else? 
And then what happens is you start getting into all these discussions and you basically have to frame it a certain way. I read a book about how to, it's called Tactics, How to Talk to People. And he said, we need to be very careful how we start the discussion because that's setting the, the pace for where we go. This man was talking to a woman in the supermarket and the topic of abortion came up. You know what he said? Getting it started. He said, so you're okay with killing babies. And the term abortion never came up. Why? Because he set that tone. Is that what they're doing? Yes. Don't let them call it, what, uh, a, a conglomeration of flesh. You know, it's not a life. It doesn't have any of these things. And you think about this. this. I'm saying the argumentation, this isn't our lesson either. But the way that people think, they don't really carry out to logical conclusions. She says, my uterus, my opinion. If you're carrying a girl, does she get an opinion? My uterus, my opinion. This doesn't make any sense. They don't carry these things out to their logical conclusions. But we have to think about this. We know, and think about this. We have the Revolutionary War, 1776. We declare our independence. People would say, we came out from underneath the tyranny of England, and what did we get? You still had laws. You still had a government system. You still had to pay taxes. Getting liberty really does not ha carry this idea of 100% absolute freedom. Are we still bound by something? We know that we are. So when you come over to Galatians chapter 5, and he talks about liberty, does that mean we're just going crazy with all manner 100%? Religious freedom, or there's still not some governing factors. I don't have a problem with this. I'm saying we've got our Second Amendment rights, but let's transfer this into the religious world. People say, don't tread on me in the religious world. And what are they doing? Here you've got a homosexual priest marrying two homosexual men. You've got the Pope praying to Mary. Joyce Myers, one of the biggest woman pastors, quote pastors, that's an impossibility. Verse 23, you have to be the husband of one wife. And then this young boy playing the piano for the whole congregation. This is what people are looking at. But really, in this sense though, if we were to say in a government, in a, in a national government, we don't just have open reign. I mean, we've got a system. So why would they, you don't live this way in America, why would you think you get to live this way in a religious setting? Anything goes. Well, what else is that called? Anarchy. And what happens? You go back to the Judges 19 time frame. There's no law on the land. Everybody does what they think is right. And we all know this idea of coexist is an impossibility. You get the crescent moon with the nation of Islam or just the Quran Islam. They'd like to put us down. And if you're being completely honest, the Jews would too. Why? They don't believe in the New Testament. So when you look at this, it makes no sense. But this is how people live in a national way. And they would say, well, we don't just have the ability to run wild. I mean, something needs to be put in place. Do Christian liberties work the same way? Now look at this in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And you've got to make a comparison here, like we said about England coming to America. Were you pressed down by England? Yes. But having relief from England does not then mean no boundaries whatsoever. What would he really be talking about in Galatians chapter 5? Individuals who had it in their mind that we have to, quote, be good enough in order to be saved. And when you start talking about who decides what is good and good enough, in Luke 18, the Pharisees said, well, I tithe of everything that I have and I fast two times in a week. That's it? I mean, if we're talking about things that are good to do, well, surely we could start plugging in more things to do. But look what he says here. We've been called... In liberty, he says, stand that fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And people are going to say, well, we've got liberty to do what we want. Do we treat liberty with, with that definition in any other sense? Now let's make another example. Look at Romans chapter 4. We're talking about terms, liberty. And look at what Romans 4 says. They'll use this word here, and they're the exact same word in the Greek. Romans 4, 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And I've read so many books that are by denominational people, and they'll say, these are accounting terms. This was placed in somebody's account. Listen, just saying that, oh, this is an accounting term. 
does not then just take away this idea that nothing has to be done. What did Abraham have to produce? Faith. What was it placed into his account for? Faith. But they come up with this one idea like they treat liberty and say, well, if you've got liberty, then nothing can press against you. We never treat liberty that way. We realize that we have freedom, freedom from oppression, freedom from tyranny, but we still have balance set into place. Now look at what he says in Galatians 5.13. A lot of people would just rather not read this verse. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty only. Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, this is what I, a point I would like to make about spiritual liberty is not necessarily the same thing as physical liberties. With our liberties that we have, what does he say that we should not be doing with them? And you're imagining the people who come in with their big guns into the 7-Eleven. They want you to see that. He says here, we shouldn't be pressing our liberties on other people who may not see them as a liberty. But by love, serve one another. Use not it for an occasion to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at 1 Corinthians 8.13. In the chapter of 1 Corinthians 8, you've got some people who have certain problems with <clears throat> eating certain meats that had once been offered to an idol. And Paul says, look, the idol is nothing. Eating meat is nothing. But look what he says here. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Terms. <clears throat> this does not mean if it makes him upset. A lot of people would be upset for somebody owning an AR-15. And they'd say, well, I don't understand why you need that. That doesn't mean anything to you. This person has a deep-seated conscience problem. Why? Because they associate it with sinful activity. These individuals would look at the meat and say, look, we left out of that idolatry. We don't want any part of it. And Paul would say, that's fine. When I'm with them, I won't eat the meat. See, that's how Christian liberties work. <clears throat> but just because somebody in a national liberty says, well, I don't like that, you know, Leon's got this big old gun, I just don't think he should have that. You have a constitutional right, you have a God-given right. But these other things, these other elements, Paul says the meat's nothing. I don't need that. And if it's hurting their conscience in a religious sense, he says, then I'm going to avoid that thing. Giving the full knowledge that it doesn't mean anything. So here's what people do with this. We're not going to necessarily cover every base on this, but we do need to have this discussion because it's a big issue right now. <laughs> have you wondered about this? I'm saying, can't you read your Bible? Can we pray to Jesus? Can we pray to the Holy Spirit? And should we be praying that we receive the Holy Spirit? I talk, and you might say, well, who's asking that? I talked to a 15-year-old from Alabama who was recently baptized, and he was actually talking to me, and he said, he said, he asked me some questions on the Holy Spirit, and we get done, and he said, well, I'm going to tell you. He said, when I was baptized, he said, part of why I did that, he said, it was more in my mind that I needed the Spirit to start helping me. And he said, but now I'm doing study, and it doesn't look like it works that way. If a young man would think I need to be baptized so that the Spirit can help me, I'm sure there's plenty of people who say we need to be praying for it to receive the Spirit so they can help us. But we're going to look at some texts and think about this. Well, when we ask the question, we're going to make a conclusion, should we do it? Even after you make a conclusion, some people are still going to say, well, that's my liberty, Galatians 5.1, to do that. Is that how liberty works? If something has been set in order, and I'm saying we would never do that in a national sense, national sense, you're going down the highway at 60 miles an hour, I'm an American. It's my liberty to go 75 if I want to. We don't treat anything that way. So let's look at some of these points, and let's look at points of liberty in the Old Testament and really see how this worked out. You can have liberty, and you can have freedom from a certain, amount, a certain type of oppression. It doesn't mean they're not standards still put into place. Think about this. These are very simple we know them, but we're going to put some, uh, make some viewpoints on them. Everybody is, and I would say everybody in this room, I don't think everybody in the world is familiar with Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu, when you look at the text, they're actually using some of, quote, their liberty. Because look how the text actually says this. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now what we would look at this here and, and say, liberty, why we have this in red, what do some people base everything that they do on? Well, if I don't get a flat out, don't do this, then I don't see a problem with it. And look how Leviticus 10 actually poses this. They did something 
not following the command, what did they do? They basically improvised. They came up with their own way of doing. It's not the commanded pattern. And what happens? There went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now, we have it both ways, actually, because if you want to put for your notes, in Exodus 30, verse number 9, that's an explicit statement. Don't use this type of incense, and it calls it strange. Don't use strange incense in the fire. And what did they do? What did they do? They took their censers and put there in incense and offered strange fire. So, did they do something other than what was authorized? Yes. Did they break an explicit command to not do something? Yes. But for anybody who thinks, well, the Bible didn't say, no. The Bible did say, and then here it gives us this picture of you follow what the pattern has already been said to be. Not come up with these ideas of, well, it didn't say not to, therefore we're going to do it. We know that's how people treat the piano in their worship. Very famous one, Nadab and Abihu. Now you keep going, and you look at 1 Samuel 13, King Saul. Therefore, this is King Saul, it says, Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. This is 1 Samuel 13, 12. And if you look at 1 Samuel 10, 8, this is where the whole picture starts. Samuel says, I'm going to come to you in seven days. I'll offer the sacrifice for the people. Now, when you look at passages like this, and we're talking about Galatians 5.1, an individual has liberty, is what the text says. But does liberty then give the idea that you just get to do whatever you want to do? And in situations like this, when you look at 1 Samuel 13, 12, what's interesting, just like with Nadab and Abihu, in Nadab and Abihu's situation, it says they didn't offer according to the command. And when you look at 1 Samuel 13, 12, you actually have a picture of an individual when it says, I forced myself to do what? To do something that I normally would not do. Now, when you look at this, and I'm saying... It would have been better, 1 Samuel 15 is going to come along and say it's better to be obedient than to offer a sacrifice. But what does Saul actually have a problem with here? Why would you force yourself to do something against your conscience, when Rome, which we know he doesn't have Romans 14, but Romans 14 says not to do that. He said, he's basically had this problem here and he said, well, I don't know that Samuel's going to show up. We're almost at the time where he's supposed to be and he's going to offer for the people. And he makes up in his mind, for some reason, he's held up, he's not coming, and you force yourself to do this. Instead of realizing, can God actually cover his people without the sacrifice? If they're going into a battle, can he not actually take care of the people and realize, look, this is what the prophet said, but he's not here. God is still going to take care of us even though the man failed to show up. But he forces himself to go ahead and do it. What's the outcome? Nadab and Abihu are devoured by fire. And then let's look at verse number 13 of 1 Samuel 13. When you look at this, and it's, it, I'm saying it's easy for us to understand where he was coming from. That I would say this is exactly the same thing as Abraham. In a, uh, Genesis 16, Abraham doesn't know that Sarah is going to be the mother. He just knows a child is coming. So what does he do? He comes up with his best idea of what to do. Saul says, well, we don't know that Samuel's going to show up, so what can we do? He's working out his best way, but that wasn't the good choice. Look what Samuel says. Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the, now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. What ends up happening? Saul basically begins his way out. Saul was chosen by God. The people didn't really appreciate Saul. He's a humble man. Not only is he a humble man, I think he did a good job as a parent to raise Jonathan to turn out the way that he did. All kinds of good qualities for him, but what ends up happening? You make this big mistake and it changes the whole trajectory of your life. But somebody would look at that today, if we were living then, they would say, well, that's Saul's liberty. But we have to ask the question, is that really what Galatians 5 is trying to teach us? That in these circumstances, depending on the situation, we might break or alter God's law in some fashion. And it's good for us in the study that we're doing because we could look at uh, Saul's situation and say, well, you know God didn't need the animal to protect the people because Habakkuk 2.4 says they were going to go 70 years and never make a sacrifice. Were well, they going to be okay? Habakkuk 2.4 says they would be okay. So you and I get to look at these passages and realize that God is gracious, but God still expects us to follow His law. 
He didn't have liberty, and he went against his better judgment. And whatever excuse you could make and say, look, I didn't want to do it, but I did, that's not going to be enough. You've already basically messed the whole system up and, and put, set the course for the future. Now look at 2 Samuel 6. We're noticing, aren't we, these aren't just open states of rebellion. I mean, these are some pretty good folk. Now, there's some discussion to be had about Nadab and Abihu. But I don't think that Saul was necessarily acting in just this presumptuous thing. He says, I forced myself to do it. When you look at 2 Samuel 6, this is Uzzah. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Now, we've had these discussions. When some, this is overlaid with gold, the ark is overlaid with gold. When you're talking about the materials, is that gold any more precious than any other type of gold? Is the wood more valuable than any other type of wood? No, we know it. Even God would say it's just a box. But what is actually the symbolization of it? It's a holy thing. Who among us, if we had an item like that, would not say, you can't let it fall, and what happened? Crack? Be damaged in some sense? I'm saying natural instinct and reflexes. This is your holy item is now falling off the cart, and we know what's the answer. The Bible says they shouldn't have been carried on a cart anyways. The Bible says they should have put staves through the holes and carried it on their shoulders, and that way it would be stable. We realize that. They're doing wrong. But we're talking about your reflexes now. I'm, I can't say that reflex-wise, I would not reach out and grab that thing. And he does. For the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. 2 Samuel 6, and for your own notes, Numbers 4.15 is one of the passages where it says, carry it by staves, not on a cart. They should have known better. And you think about this. If we're talking about liberty and excuses that could be made, somebody could say, good intentions, liberty, he was trying to do the right thing. The right thing is to consult with the Bible and figure out what you're going to do before you start doing it. Rather than just throwing everything together and say, well, they got the ark and we got to bring it back to Shiloh. How are we going to get it here? Then you might have this to be said. Why didn't somebody instruct him? I don't know. Maybe they all collectively together by this time frame don't have any better sense. How is it the case that they're without the ark anyways? You go back to the beginning of the book of Samuel, and it's been gone a long time. Eli's sons, they take it out to a battle as if it's some lucky charm. The Bible never said that the Ark of Covenant worked that way. So people are using their liberty. See how that works? Sons of Eli used their liberty to take it out to a battle. They lost it. Uzzah is using his, quote, liberty to carry it on, on an ox cart, and he touches it, and he dies. Now, people, what's an excuse that someone could say as we're looking at this material? That's Old Testament. Listen, Romans 5 says they had grace under the Old Testament. Look at Romans 5, verse number 20. That's really not an issue. And they surely had the information. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Did they have a load of sinful activity happening in the Old Testament? Yes. But look what he says here. There was enough grace to cover these folk. But what we're seeing is using just putting a label on it, liberty does not make it justified. So when people today come to their worship assembly and we start talking about, well, we'd like to introduce this, I would say the big, two biggest questions, can we find it in the Bible? And then number two, why? Why would we do that? And I'm talking about people who do these weird gimmicks to the Lord's Supper. We know based on 1 Corinthians 11, this is a time to reflect. And does it matter to y'all what the lights are like in here? If we turn the lights down low, does that help your mind go back to the cross in some better way? I've been in one of those situations. We visited a denomination, and I don't think they were taking the Lord's Supper. They were getting to a point in their Bible study where they wanted everybody to get real still. And you know, on the, on the plank that I had to Micah sitting there with me, I said, I can't see my Bible now. I mean, you're up there teaching, and I can't even read with you. You haven't done anything except hurt the study. Why? Is it in the Bible? Why would we do that? But all these points of liberty. Now, for one side of this, aside from Saul, 
Somebody might say, well, these are not very well-known situations in the Bible anyways. Do you think a lot of people know about Uzzah? I don't think my generation knows about Uzzah. I do think that some of y'all's friends and kinfolk might know about Uzzah touching the holy thing and dying. But he's becoming a less popular name. Okay, let's think about this. David, King David, man after God's own heart. He's going to be used as an example in Romans chapter 4. But look what happens when you start talking about liberty. And we know that there are some things that were done in the Old Testament, Acts 17, verse number 30, where God, it says either he winked at it or he used people's mistakes and turned it into a teaching opportunity. We don't realize the length, breadth of our actions. Do you think, really, I'm saying, think about this now. Does anybody think that Alexander Campbell had in his mind how big he would actually be later in history? I mean, you're just, you're plugging along. Who can actually gauge what you're doing in the time that you're doing it? But here's what I'm saying. And really, you could think that about David. David doesn't know how many lines of kings are going to be, I'm saying, from his own lineage. Did David know the kingdom was going to split? And then you get a whole great number more of kings that you have to keep up with? But look what he does. It came to pass when the king sat in his house, the Lord had given him rest about, round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. So what's he saying? He's saying we've got it better, made better than the ark does, and the ark is the holy thing, and we're just flesh. We live better than the ark does. Look at the response. Nathan said to the king, Go do that all is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Can you make a house big enough for God? Can you make a house beautiful enough for God? And he says, Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and a tabernacle. Now, he's basically making a point here, like Leon said during the collection. God doesn't need anything from us. But David is using, quote, his liberty. And it says here, even to this day, but I have walked in a tent and a tabernacle. In all places wherein I have walked with the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I command to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build you not me a house of cedar? Whose idea is the temple? It's David's liberty. And when we talk about we don't realize how far-reaching our ideas are, how far-reaching was this one idea? David says, we should really build up something nice for the Ark of the Covenant and, and really make it a symbol. And God says, when did I ask for that? He set them on a course, centuries long, nothing but trouble. Now, we look at the New Testament and we realize a teaching element is made out of it, but in Jeremiah 7, 4, they became so enamored with this great temple that was David's idea that when Jeremiah came in and said, y'all need to really clean up your act, the people said, well, as long as we have the temple, that's what this means. And you look at Jeremiah 7, he's telling them to repent. Trust you not in lying words, saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. As long as we've got the temple, God's with us. Whose idea is that? David's liberty. Even to, and you might say, well, they really got that worked out. You talk about things will shake out in the wash. Ezra, they come back from their captivity. Well, they'll get that all sorted out in the captivity. No, they don't. In Ezra 3, when the temple was rebuilt, many of the priests and the Levites and the fathers, who were ancient men, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice. Why? Seventy years, no sacrifice. What does that include? What should you be thinking about? Faith. Seventy years, these people still didn't figure it out. We don't know how far stretching our ideas are, and look how big we can miss it. These people had the biggest captivity. I would say, aside from the Egyptian captivity, it might have lasted longer. Take a whole nation of people in, you get the information, you get the prophets, and you're being told it's not about the temple, and you come out and you say, man, this temple ain't as good as what we had before. Who cares? We get to, we get to have our whole process again. Many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy for the noise of weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Here's another thing about Romans 14, one of those liberty passages. He says in Romans 14, no man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. 
And that's why he is so emphatic about our liberties. I can't use my liberty for occasion to the flesh, and I can't press my liberty on other people. Why? It's not just my liberty. It touches everybody. And when we look at these texts, it touches everybody. David was touching generations to come with an improper idea. Now look at 2 Samuel 24. Why are we using David? He's a prime figure. In 2 Samuel 24, verse number 2, if you're coming up with reasons why, there could be any number of reasons why David wanted to do this. We do know what the real reason is. Why would you number your army? If you know every... <clears throat> Does anybody really remember why Kennedy sent us into space? It wasn't about getting to the moon, and people say we didn't even get to the moon. It was about we don't want people to get ahead of us in technology. If there's a race going on, we need to at least be keeping up. Now, if you're watching everybody's armies grow around you, what do you want to know? Are we getting enough people? And if not, I mean, they already had instituted a draft of some degree. You get 20 years of age, you're enlisted in a, in a fine capacity, depending on certain elements, if, if there's other people who can carry on the family line. But look what he says. The king said to Joab, captain of the host, which was with him, go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. This is directly against what he was supposed to do. In Deuteronomy 17, a king could not multiply horses, he couldn't multiply wives, and he wasn't really supposed to multiply gold and silver the way that they did. And why? God did not want their confidence in themselves. God wanted their confidence in them. You keep reading 2 Samuel 24, Joab will say to him, why do we need to do that? Somebody trying to help you out, but that's his liberty, and look what happens. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land, or wilt thou flee from uh, three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in the land, now advise, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon the people, upon Israel, from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba seventy thousand men. Now who, who did David touch with his liberty at that point? 70,000 people died. And you don't know what type of people it doesn't say, but what are we basically now getting a picture of? People's children dying, wives, children losing their provider, their parent, the father of the house. And, and for what? Because David wanted a moment to use his liberty. And that's how people really do it, isn't it? They would say, well, really, what's wrong if we take a number of the people? What's wrong with Uzzah if by good intention he's trying to staple the ark you have to look back at this because something, somebody was already doing something incorrectly. We're never going to basically say, I mean, we have the saying, two wrongs don't make a right. Because we're carrying the ark incorrectly doesn't give us the right to do something else against God's law. Because you're having a moment of weakness then doesn't give you the right to go out and count all the people. So when we start looking at liberty and we come to Galatians chapter 5, what should we be realizing? People are abusing the term liberty. Nobody really is 100% free, are we? You, you've got a boss, you've got a president, you've got state troopers, you've got a spouse. I mean, you've got kids you've got to live by. See, I'm saying we set an example for everybody. People are doing the same with us. Nobody lives or dies in themselves. You're being touched in all kinds of different ways. And so we start talking about, well, my liberty. Do you think, though, that if some people could get a picture, I'm saying, even to their kids, their grandkids, their great-grandchildren, if they could see what the activities that they're going to use for their liberty could set them on a trajectory of, I'll say this. You do some reading of our brethren in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, I think if they could see where those brethren are now in the Christian church, if they could see the tra trajectory they put them on back then, they would say, we don't need the piano. Why? It didn't stop there. For the Christian church now, if you're with the disciples of Christ, they basically let women in leadership positions of their worship. I think plenty of people would say back then, that liberty is not necessary. And that's what Paul's trying to get across to us. And we have all these pictures in the Old Testament where individuals had a, a type of liberty, but it came with consequences. 
Now let's look about this. We've got all these examples. Nadab and Abihu, they did which was against the commandment. It wasn't necessarily authorized. You have Uzzah, you have King Saul, and you have King David. Some, I'm saying some good people made some big mistakes, and anyone could label it as liberty. So now let's think about this as far as people say, can we pray to Jesus? Can we pray to the Holy Spirit? Should we be asking for the Spirit in our prayer? If you, I'm saying, as we just read those examples, would you not start thinking that when we come to God's law, we ought to be careful? <laughs> and I'm saying some of these things, too, I can imagine if you read Matthew 15, Matthew 15 is where the Pharisees get on Jesus about why don't, why don't you wash your hands before you eat? Now you can go back to Leviticus and see that they are big time stretching some of those commandments. But I can imagine some of those people being honestly concerned and say, look, we're just trying to be safe. Right? They don't want to come close to it and so they say, look, we're just setting up some measures where we can be safe. I get that. But when you start looking at this in 1 Peter 3, 7 and 12, what can hinder your prayers? <clears throat> Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You want to pray. You've got things you need to pray about. And what says can actually hinder that? An improper relationship with your spouse. That's getting in the way of your prayers. Now, why would we not think that if we change the whole pattern of prayer, that it's even going to work anymore? Because that's what Saul said back in 1 Samuel 13. He said, we didn't think you were coming. I forced myself to offer the sacrifice. Did it do anything for anybody? No. So in today's round, where people are saying, well, I think we have the liberty to pray to Jesus, pray to the Holy Spirit, we should really be considering. How far-reaching is that liberty going to turn into? What's it going to develop into? Is it, even get, is it even according to the pattern? Should we even be trying to alter prayer based on what's being set up, knowing that our prayers can be hindered? I mean, we say to people, and it's a big deal to some people, that they can't pray. And then we as Christians, because the idea of the word liberty, they're misusing the word liberty, they have the idea, well, I have liberty, therefore we can do it. It may not be worth it. Because we know the text says our prayers can be hindered. Look what he says in verse number 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And in a biblical text now, what is evil? Cain changing the process is called evil in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 12. So when you say, well, God doesn't hear evil folk, who are evil folk and what is evil? Changing the pattern according to God is evil. So right away, we already have some very dangerous ground for individuals who say, I think we ought to pray this way. And can we go back to Romans 14 again? If you look at Romans chapter 14, we know, I'm saying, some questions need to be answered. And we've got to have some discussions on some points, and we've already said in our classes that it is good to revisit things and restudy them. But in Romans chapter 14, look what he says in verse number 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive you, but not to doubtful disputations. And then in verse number 5, he says, One man esteems one day above another, Another is seen with every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. We really shouldn't be throwing out these what-ifs and these hypotheticals. The text says until you're fully persuaded in it. And these folk who are saying, well, how do we know we can't pray to Jesus? Show me a pattern of it. Show me where any of the apostles were doing it. And really say this too. I mean, the question has come up and it needs to come up. What constitutes a prayer? And they're going to go to Acts 7 when they say that. What constitutes a prayer? Doubtful disputations. Are you sure about it? Not really. Then why are you bringing it up? Fully persuaded. Doubtful disputations. Now let's think about this. Can our prayers be hindered? Yes. We saw from 1 Samuel 13 that if we weren't following the pattern, the sacrifice didn't do anything. Liberty does not just mean running wild. Now look at Luke 11. This is what Jesus said to us on prayer. And you think about this. You look at the book of Luke, why? It's just a noted thing. Luke discusses the prayer life of Jesus more than any of the other books. And this is what he says to his disciples. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And this is it's a good discussion for us to have because there are elements in here that are going to have to be discussed. I 
basically, I read this some time ago, and I know I have a note for this, type, this very topic, praying to Jesus. Would he actually have discussed this if the people hadn't asked it? And what people would say by that is they would say, is it really important who we address our prayer to? And they would ask, would Jesus even have made this a teaching matter if the people hadn't asked it? How do you know that he would? This is going to come up again in Romans chapter 8, where Paul is going to say, for we know not what we pray. Why? Because they don't actually understand where to put themselves in accordance with these Jews and the, temp the whole temple system. So he says, when you're praying for the kingdom to come, what are you also praying for? That the stiff-necked Jews are going to be put out of the way. And so they're saying, we don't know how to pray about these things. But look at this. How does he say that we should just simply address our prayer? These signs said, you pray to the Father. What's wrong with that? When you look at the Old Testament system, and you basically have the assurance, the prophet of God says, Samuel says, I'm going to come, I'm going to offer sacrifice for you. Why do you need to be the person who actually does the whole sacrificing process? Are you getting the benefit? Yes. Why do I need to be involved in it? And that's exactly what the people said, the sons of Korah, of Korah the sons of Kohath, said to Moses. Y'all took too much on yourself, and we need to do more. Have you ever heard of somebody volunteering for more work? They wanted to be seen more. And Jesus says here, out of his own mouth, and where's Jesus getting his doctrine? Well, Jesus is going to say that this is all being revealed to him by the Spirit also. And he says, when you pray, you pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Just like Nadab and Abihu, they offered not according to the commandment. What's our command? You pray to the Father. Some will say, well, he didn't say not to. When does he ever teach that way? When we read Matthew 19 and he says that a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, he didn't have to stop and say, now that, does, that, does, that means you can't be out here marrying your cat. And men can't be marrying men. And all these other types of relationships can't be abiding. He just says what it is. What is marriage? An eligible, eligible man and an eligible woman. When he says about prayer, you pray to the Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Now let's think about this. I mean, this basically should settle it. And I said this morning, it's not like this was a detailed discussion on the actual topic, but rather getting our minds ready. Does liberty mean actually no bounds? Or does liberty mean the freedom from oppression that these individuals faced under the law? That we ourselves would feel if we thought that we had to prove ourselves by a law system. Let's move to the next point. He said pray to the Father. And then Luke 11, look at this. Should we be praying for the Spirit? Just like we talked about a couple weeks ago, we asked the question, there's a command in 1 Corinthians 13 where he says, desire spiritual gifts. That's a command that he gave, Paul gave. Do we desire spiritual gifts? And we would have to say no. Because they don't exist for us in that capacity anymore. When you're reading Luke 11 and somebody might say, well, Jesus said pray for the Spirit, so why don't y'all pray for the Spirit? If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? But we have to think about this. In the book of Acts, and we have to use the book of Acts because that's our starting point, who ever prayed for the Spirit and got it? You never see that. In Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, Cornelius has no idea what's going on. The only information Cornelius has is send for Peter to come down <coughs> here and teach you. Holy Spirit falls on him. Acts chapter 8, how the Samaritans come in contact with the Spirit? Laying on the apostles' hands. Nobody is praying to receive the Spirit. So what does that even mean? What was going to be a sign, according to Joel 2, about the coming kingdom? The Spirit was going to be poured out. This is simply an extension of what he said to them here. You pray, thy kingdom come. And with the coming of the kingdom, what was also going to come with that? The coming of the Spirit. Now think about this. Who in here prays, thy kingdom come? Not one of us. Why? We realize we're in the kingdom. So if you're not praying for the kingdom to come anymore, why would you be praying for the accompanying spirit that came with the kingdom? See, we can knock these things out, and anybody else who... They start pulling the line, well, that's my liberty to do these things. 
When we start forming up some argumentation, what are they going to say then? Well, I don't think we can really come to a, a final conclusion on this. When does the Bible say that? If he tells us we can have the same mind and same judgment, and think about this. We have a set pattern on how to pray. Why would you want to deviate from that? And people would say this. Well, I think it's disrespectful that we don't give Christ and the Holy Spirit some reverence in our prayer. Why would you not give them reverence by doing what they said? And if you look at John 15, at the end of John 15, there obviously is a set pattern of authority between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if they don't have a problem with it, why would I? So let's think about this. Did he tell us in Luke 11 who to pray to? Jesus did. He said to pray to the Father. And he <clears throat> gave us who to address. He did give us some subject matter that still stands. We pray for those who do us wrong. We pray for our daily bread. But we don't pray for the kingdom to come because we realize it's been established. And therefore we wouldn't pray for the Holy Spirit that would come with the bringing of the kingdom. So think about this. This would be pretty easy to show people. They ask us, why don't y'all pray to receive the Spirit? We can show them the kingdom is here. We don't have to pray for the Spirit. We have the Word. We don't have to pray for the Spirit. And this is what we can say to them. You may not receive the Spirit like they did, but you can enter the same kingdom that they did. And that's what we discussed in the Bible class. We're asking people questions to get them thinking, but on the background, we really have a direction we want them to go. I have no problem talking about the Holy Spirit with individuals because in my mind, I'm basically going to be working them back to what they really need. You know, let's put it this way. Even if we did get the Spirit like they did in Acts chapter 2, people in denomination wouldn't have it. They're not being added to the church, Acts chapter 2. They're not obeying the gospel in Acts chapter 2. You may not receive the Spirit, but you can enter the kingdom, just like they did, John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. And someone might say, well, you're using John 3, 5, and it says the Spirit's in there too. <clears throat> We've had this discussion. If you read 1 Corinthians 12, Paul will say they read Moses every Sabbath day. Well, how do you read a person? The people are reading his <clears throat> writings. So when it says here, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, we're following what the Spirit is actually dealing out. We're following the teachings. And what's that going to involve? Being immersed in water. He cannot enter the kingdom of God any way else. Acts chapter 8, verse number 12. For when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. You can enter the kingdom. And right after these people were baptized, why did the apostles have to come down from Jerusalem? Because the Spirit hadn't touched anybody. Entering the kingdom and being baptized really don't have anything to do with miraculous ability in the first century. It had to do with, can you find an apostle and will they lay hands on you? And we look at some of the, the scriptures too, I don't think they laid hands on just anybody. Because he's going to say in 1 Corinthians 12, not everybody's worth of miracles. And there were some people like Acts chapter 8, Simon the Sorcerer, who would just want to abuse it. So there's going to have to be some uses there. What's really important you look at these people, they, they did have the Spirit helping them, they had the Spirit giving them information, and you see people like Peter still getting mixed up with the Jews and the Gentiles. The Bible never said that the Spirit was given to help people stay away from sin. It was there to give out the information, and they have free will to do with that information what they're going to do. So this morning, would the analogy that we made make sense? You can be taken out of the tyranny of another nation, but you still have a law system. You still have some governing factors. Do we have liberty today in Christ? Yes. Does that mean he left us without any standards and any boundaries? No. We don't have to worry about the ramifications of them necessarily because Romans chapter 8 tells us the blessing we have to be in Christ. But you don't get that blessing unless you're in the kingdom. So this morning, as we study some of this information out, is it for ourselves because this right now is a hot topic? Praying to Jesus, praying to the Spirit, praying for the Spirit. Is it a hot topic? Yeah. We need to know that information. But on the same token, we need, to be, we need to know how to take this information, give it to our lost friends, and get them to start seeing the truth. You might have, they think they have the Spirit, but are you even in the kingdom? And somebody might say, the kingdom's not even here yet. What are you talking about? Here we go. <laughs> I mean, at that point, we might, should be saying to people, buckle up, right? Because we've got a lot of ground to cover, but they can understand it. This morning, it does just take the amount of our, our willingness to do with, to talk to these people. And there was a point that Dad made in the class, and we'll close out this morning. We already said about these individuals and their liberty, how many people they touched. 
And we've covered this in our prophets class, but let's close out this morning with this. Look at Amos chapter 7. You know, I'm saying, you've already lived through it. People are talking bad about you. They call you stick in the mud, and they probably call us worse names than that. But when you look at Amos chapter 7, and people talk about the church of Christ and their reputation, what is, people say this way, every knock is a plug. In Amos chapter 7, look at this. Verse number 10. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Was Amos actually in front of the king speaking to him? No. But the audience that Amos was talking to took that same message and delivered it to the king. Why? Knocking Amos. And what's the text going to say? Amos is going to say, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. And they're all going to be saying, some country dude come up in here talking about our idols. Talking about Jeroboam too is going to be put down. And what did they all have to see? That exact same thing happened. So we're talking to people, and maybe we're not going to reach them with the truth, but when they take our message, which is the gospel message, and they take it to somebody else and they talk, talk trash about it, somebody else that's hearing it might say, you know, that actually does make some sense though. And then they might say, you've got to give them something on this because it's in the Bible. It clearly says it. Don't get discouraged on these things. We have our liberty. That's for us. Does that mean we get to run wild? No, but we're trying to get people to come out from underneath the oppression of sin so they can feel some relief. Matthew chapter 11. They're tired. They're carrying a heavy load. He wants to give them some relief. And we might think that we're not going to accomplish that. And I'm saying Amos 7.10 with the individual that you and I have in mind Maybe not, but they might take that and give it to somebody else. And I'll say this too, time frames, people that we're saying now, they may not even go to church, but when times get hard, and let's say they've got kids, they never went to church, kids start asking, why did we never go to church? And what can they say to their kids? People will say things like, well, we never found a church of Christ to go to. And isn't that sad? They could be telling their kids, well, if you're going to go to church, this is when you need to check out. All we've got to do is put the information out there and realize how much influence, how far reaching all of this is. This morning, hopefully this information, as we looked at the idea of liberty, realizing we do have liberty, but that doesn't mean we get to abuse it. We should be enjoying it, though. And as we look at all these points that we saw in the Old Testament, realize what great influence and outreach we really do have and we should be taking advantage of it. And if we're not, we do need to be making some changes. So let's think about this as we stand and sing the song of courage.